This might be you someday. Your patient is struggling to breathe. You tilt the head back to open the upper airway. You're going to slide the blunt end of your laryngoscope over the tongue and past the epiglottis. I'll be talking about that. Now we're going to take the endotracheal tube and guide it down to the trachea, but not too far. Inflate the bulb so that that endotrach tube stays in place. And then we're going to just take the tube, hook it to a ventilator, tape it to the side of the mouth. All right. So how are we going to remember the airway? We go from nasal cavity, nasopharynx, oropharynx, hypopharynx. All right. The colors help a lot. Soft palate. That's the roof of the mouth, if you're wondering what that is. And here's the tongue. So oral, mouth, tongue kind of makes sense. Nasal, think of the nose. Hypo means under. Epiglottis, big word there. All right, some students will try to remember this by, hey, do you have a friend who's never nice or even happy? Leave them. <laughs> leave them. Okay. I'm not telling you to leave your friends. Uh, that's just one way students remember this. Okay, I mentioned the epiglottis. But let's see a video of how, because it's like a in a toll tank, the flapper. And you're going to see that little epiglottis here at the junction of the oral and hypopharynx. Watch that. There's a bolus of food into the esophagus. All right. So there is the epiglottis. And it's going to flap down and cover the trachea. But the problem is sometimes people are talking and they're eating. Talking and eating. And the epiglottis gets confused. And that bolus ends up going in the wrong place. Take a breath. Down the trachea. All right. It is so cool. But you got to respect your epiglottis. Right, if you have to, you tell someone, hey, i got to swallow my bolus, okay? Now, we do have this thing called epiglottitis. Itis means inflammation. Uh, HIV, and you can get a vaccine for this. Um, I recommend it, especially for children. Uh, look at this patient, because what I'm seeing is epiglottitis, and here's a it's a barium swallow, I think, to highlight the airway, and we have obstruction. And you don't want to just jam an endotracheal tube down there, but you might have to. I worry because. I see implants and maybe dentures here, and those may come loose and add to the problem. So that's a tricky patient right there. That's uh, a challenge. This, uh, this shows it well. If you want to take a breath in, the diaphragm is going to contract and move down because we want to expand the capacity of the lungs. Now, when you expel air, expiration, we are going to have the diaphragm relax and it becomes like a parachute and pushes the air out. Pretty cool. Now your lungs are not like a party balloon. Like when they're empty, they don't collapse because the pleural sacs. They're going to keep the lungs in position. Uh, we do have this effusion occurring sometimes, like a congestive heart failure or infection where fluids get between the pleural membranes, the pleural space. All right. And it can uh, lower the oxygen content of the tissues. All right, we're going to take a look at this video because it's going to show this exchange of gases. Because what happens, okay, I'm going to move ahead. Here we go. Here we have it. Okay, so we're now in the bronchial tree, which I'll talk about shortly. So as air comes in, it's going to move down the bronchioles into the alveoli, okay? And here's the word right here, alveoli. Singular is alveolus. So each breath we take, we're exchanging carbon dioxide with precious oxygen in the pulmonary capillaries of the lungs. All right, <laughs> that's incredible. All right, we have some variations such as nitrogen narcosis. In this case, 
uh, sometimes all the bends or um, decompression sickness. If you go down over 150 feet, then nitrogen gas is in your bloodstream. And if you get go to the surface too fast, then it could be painful or even fatal. Now this is my daughter, and this is me. And I had a mild case of the bends because uh, I shot to the surface so fast. I wasn't even 100 feet, so I got a feeling of what it must be like to have the bends. Okay, hypoxia. This is another variation in breathing. This is when you're in high elevations and oxygen doesn't follow the low pressure gradient. I, uh, we get tachypnea, which is hyperventilation. Breathing fast, because the body's trying to take in more oxygen. Sometimes edema, which means fluid. And this makes matters worse, because now our lungs are full of fluid, and we have a serious problem. Now, these two guys saved my life in the highlands of the Himalayas, uh, the mountains north of India. I had a bad case of hypoxia, and they carried a lot of my gear. Um, I paid them, of course, but if they weren't there, I don't know if I'd be here today. All right, Kenyan distance runners. I'm thinking of uh, Tokyo Olympic, Olympics 2021. This is Jep Chuchir. I lived two years in Kenya. And uh, Jep Chuchir, uh, on a way to Kukumbia Harakasana. <laughs> she could run so fast. Okay. It's kind of like blood doping because on, if you do this in high elevations, you get a lot of red blood cells. Good way to train. All right, so uh, sound. And ronky, like, uh, sounds like snoring. Sometimes they inhale a popsicle stick. Strider is high pitched on inhalation, breathing in. Wheezing is on the exhalation. All right, so let's get those straight because strider and wheezing kind of sound similar, but you got to watch them. Are they breathing out? It's strider. Are they breathing, excuse me, in? It's strider. <laughs> They're breathing out. It's, it's uh, wheezing. All right. We have a PFT, pulmonary function test. Uh, a normal breath is called the tidal volume. Then if we uh, take a big breath in, that's called inspiration or inspiratory. If we exhale, we call that expiration. Vital capacity is the inspiratory reserve plus expiratory, inspiratory. Okay, sometimes it's better just to see it in action, and that's what I have here. So we're going to look at the PFT uh, in a second here, but while, while that's loading. So how do we get vital capacity? Because we want to know how much uh, air does those, do those lungs hold? I mean, six liters is common for most people, but okay, I'm going to move up to about around eight minutes. We get to the part where I want to see it. Here we go. So we're going to see tidal volume. All right, hopefully. Okay, now you're going to have some patients that look like this. Okay, here's tidal volume. So that's a normal breath here. And then at some point, are we moving? Yeah. The patient is going to take a breath. And it's going to shoot up. And now we're in inspiratory reserve, okay? So they took a deep breath in, and now they're going to blow it out as far as they can. And that's expiratory reserve volume, All right? Now they can't stay out down there very long. With residual volume, we can't really, just there's dead air space in our lungs. And that's just, that's fine. It still gets recycled. All right, so they're going to have to breathe again. And come back to normal breathing, which is called tidal volume. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully that helped you. Right, if you see a patient like this, wide eyes, nasal flaring, which, uh, well, usually the, the neck muscles are straining, intercostals between the ribs, we think of airway obstruction because the tidal volume should be less than a third. Okay, can you see how small tidal volume is compared to vital capacity? Vital capacity should be three times or more uh, than the tidal volume. That problem. Respiratory uh, disorders. There's many. I'm just going to hit a few highlights. TB, tuberculosis. 
all right respiratory droplets and this video shows it really nicely I think because we can see that uh, viruses and bacteria they, they like to hitchhike on respiratory droplets so if someone has a lung infection then uh, it's going to be expelled come on here we go okay this is where I want to be we're going to see it bam there it goes there's tuberculosis and we catch it all right okay this happens a lot all right our bodies are built to survive though all right influenza okay COVID-19 of course SARS-CoV-2 what it does is it's going to attach to these uh, ACE in, in, uh, receptors in our membranes and it's going to bind to that and tie it up and we need that ACE receptor for like basic uh, regulation and so it's not a good thing usually our immune system will knock it out in fact if you if you've had COVID once you may not get it a second time because the COVID won't get a chance to bind it's going to get killed BAM before your body uh, engulfs it or if you have the vaccine same thing your body will destroy it hopefully before it invades the um, cellular interior all right we use an, a nasopharyngeal swab which I recommend we want to go past the concha uh, because uh, influenza, well, it's, it can live in lung tissue. And the deeper you can go, generally, the more success you're going to have in, in diagnosing it. Uh, the bronchi, I mentioned, there's the main bronchus, lobar, and then the segmental. And so if this tissue is inflamed, then we may get um, bronchiolitis, which over time, is uh, damaging to the lining and it's going to constrict the airway and scar and then the result is cyanosis where the fingertips and lips may turn kind of bluish because low levels of oxygen now hopefully this is temporary but for some people with uh, emphysema uh, which I'll be talking about it could be lifelong now COPD it's just anything that obstructs the airway and uh, we usually don't think of asthma as being a COPD because a COPD, we think of emphysema or bronchitis, bronchiolitis, where we get chronic hypoxia. And here we have the nasal cannula. Uh, you sometimes see people with these in an oxygen tank because what happens in emphysema is a long-term destruction of these clusters Remember we saw that video of the little grape-like clusters. This is where oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged. And so uh, if they get destroyed, uh, the most common, of course, is cigarette smoking. But uh, people that work in uh, polluted environments may also get emphysema. And, and sometimes people get emphysema and we don't even know why. Uh, so uh, they, they're going to be hypoxic. And we saw that word earlier low levels of oxygen in their tissues and so a little nasal cannula gives them the help they need now asthma is is an interesting because we have irritants and we're not all the same some people respond to smoke dust allergens like you know cat fur even cold air or exercise whatever the trigger is it's going to cause, okay, here's a normal bronchiole. Okay, remember the bronchioles? Uh, lobar, segmental, here's the main bronchus. So I'm talking about this region of the bronchial tree. If it starts to swell and fill with fluids, histamines and other uh, substances the body is producing, then we have an occluded airway. And, and, and we need intervention, all right? As someone who, who suffers from asthma, they must be prepared with a bronchodilation of some sort. Because with proper management, asthma can be you know, uh, not a problem, but it can be life-threatening if we're not careful. All right, thanks for listening.